Good afternoon and welcome, welcome to our new College of the Humanities uh, lecture. Um, those of you who know anything at all about us know that it's a very important part, a central part indeed, of our core curriculum at the college uh, that we ask our students, since we're a humanities college, uh, to take a lively interest in um, the basic concepts and methods of the natural sciences. And we have an extremely distinguished visiting professoriate, uh, including Professor Richard Dawkins, who will be lecturing to us this evening, uh, who contributes to this programme. It's a, a valuable part of what we do, and we're very honoured indeed uh, to have Richard and uh, his colleagues with us at the college. Uh, Professor Richard Dawkins, it's a terrible cliché uh, about people not needing introduction, and then a terrible, even worse cliché, uh, this is somebody who doesn't need any introduction. And of course, both clichés are usually followed by an introduction, but in this case, not. Professor Richard Dawkins. <laughs> Why, of all scientific subjects, should non-scientists learn about evolution? Some say you should learn science anyway because it's useful, or you need to know some science to form an opinion about important issues like global warming and so on. And those things are, of course, important. But I want to emphasise something that I think is more important, perhaps especially for students of the humanities. Evolution is the explanation for our existence, for your existence, the existence of all living things. Even our ability to understand our own existence is a magnificent feat of evolution, the evolution of our brains. Living things look designed. They look designed in the same sort of way as cars and computers look designed, except that machines like cars and computers really are designed. They're designed by human brains which are themselves evolved machines. Living things and living organs like brains carry a powerful illusion of design. And that illusion of design is achieved by the long, slow Darwinian process of evolution by natural selection. There's a particularly beautiful example of an evolved creature. Uh, it's not a dead leaf, um, it's actually an insect. And you've probably come across many such examples. Biologists use the word adaptation because they're shy, they're coy of calling it design, even pseudo-design, even the illusion of design. The philosopher Daniel Dennett, who I think is one of your professors, isn't he? Yes, one of our professors, I should say, um, has argued that we should not be so shy. Call it design. Just acknowledge that there are two ways in which design is achieved deliberate design by human brains and non-deliberate design by natural selection. Well, I'm not quite ready to call it design because I've learned from experience that that's so easily misunderstood by people eager to misunderstand, people incapable of distinguishing between Dennett's two kinds of design. So I will use the not very satisfying euphemism of adaptation. Adaptation means modified for a functional reason. It's the not very expressive word, not, not very apt word, I suspect, which is customarily used to express the fact that animals and plants look as though they have been designed. <coughs> Another favourite example, that's not seaweed, that's a fish. It's a leafy sea dragon, and it resembles seaweed because it is camouflaged by nestling among seaweed. You could almost diagnose, you could almost, a botanist could almost tell you what species of seaweed that fish is mimicking. Both these animals seem overwhelmingly to have been designed for speed. Each one has to be fast because the other one is. And I'll return to that topic under the heading of arms races later, if not in this lecture, in one of the subsequent ones. That's another nice example. Um, that's not a caterpillar, it's a club of caterpillars. It's a group of caterpillars clubbing together to look like a single caterpillar. I'm going to look at the concept of adaptation historically, although I'm not going to go back further than, than Darwin. David Hume, the famous philosopher, satirically put into the mouth of his creationist character, Cleanthes, an eloquent expression of how impressive we find biological adaptation and we still find it impressive, even as evolutionists. 
Cleanthes said, all these various machines and even their most minute parts are adjusted to each other with an accuracy which ravishes into admiration all men who have ever contemplated them. The curious adapting of means to ends throughout all nature resembles exactly, though it much exceeds, the productions of human contrivance, of human design, thought, wisdom and intelligence. By this argument, a posteriori, and by this argument alone, do we prove at once the existence of a deity and his similarity to human mind and intelligence. Of course, Hume didn't accept Cleanthes' argument, uh, but that was the argument that he put into his mouth. By the way, Hume, who was one of the greatest philosophers ever, also said, there is nothing to be learned from a professor which is not to be met with in books. And I want to digress just to uh, say something about what I consider the purpose of a lecture such as this is. Um, a lecture is not for imparting information. Books are for imparting information. And nowadays the internet is for imparting information. Uh, a lecture is to inspire. Uh, I don't know whether I shall uh, succeed in doing that, but in general, uh, what that means is that students should never take notes in lectures, because if they take notes, as I did when I was a student, um, you don't actually listen to the lecture. You're so busy trying to write down everything the lecturer says. And certainly in my experience, I think the experience of most of my colleagues, you take notes in lectures and you never, ever look at them again. Um, take a note by all means if something strikes you as particularly interesting and worth looking up later, um, but otherwise um, treat the lecture as something to inspire, not something to inform. I hope I haven't said anything heretical there. The Reverend William Paley, 1743 to 1805, is the man most often created with the theological argument from design, the argument that Hume's Cleanthes was putting. Uh, if something looks designed, according to natural theology, it was designed. And the more designed it looks, the stronger the argument. Paley imagined crossing a heath and stubbing his toe on a watch lying on the ground. He imagined opening up the watch and observing all the complicated cogs and springs, obviously all geared to a useful task, in this case, telling the time. The watch, Paley pointed out, implies a watchmaker. And then Paley went on, how much more strongly does something like an eye or a heart or an elbow joint imply a designer? Paley's watch and the eye that he compared it to are both statistically improbable, in that if you take their parts and randomise them, scramble them at random a million times, not once will you hit upon a combination that will, do, that will tell the time or see in full colour, uh, like a watch or an eye respectively, or indeed do anything uh, useful in a complicated way. So we see the watch, we see the eye, and we conclude that something special has happened. It didn't just happen by chance. It cannot have just happened by chance. Statistically improbable... I have to add in a previously specified direction because with hindsight every random combination every rubbish heap is as statistically improbable as any other. How astounding that of all the blades of grass on the golf course the ball landed on this particular blade of grass. How utterly improbable that is. But of course it had to land on some blade of grass and it's with hindsight that we see that it landed on this one. The reason a hole in one at golf is such a spectacular event is that the hole is specified in advance as the target of the drive. Watches and eyes have functions which you can specify in advance. They tell the time and they see respectively. Both are functions that are difficult to achieve. So a random scrambling of parts is exceedingly unlikely to perform either function with any efficiency. And the fact that a watch does tell the time accurately, the fact that an eye does see uh, in a very, very sophisticated way, um, correctly indicates to any reasonable person that it's not the product of random chance. Before Darwin came along, the only alternative to random chance was design. And even that was a very badly thought out alternative. 
everybody could think that they intuitively saw the force of the argument that Paley made that he generalised from watch to eye, that every part of every living body must have had a designer. It seemed intuitively obvious, and yet intuition was wrong. Darwin, and independently A.R. Wallace, discovered the alternative to chance and design that had deluded everybody, e even Hume, even every philosopher who'd ever lived in previous centuries. The answer is cumulative natural selection, non-random survival, non-random reproductive success. Darwin and Wallace pointed out, and both, by the way, got the idea from Robert Malthus, both pointed out that more young are born than can survive to reproduce. That means that there is competition between individuals within a species. The ones that are best fitted to survive are the ones that win the competition to reproduce. They are the ones that pass on to future generations whatever qualities help them to survive and reproduce. So as the generations go by, the typical individuals in the population become better and better at surviving and reproducing. And they become better in whatever way the particular species has of being better. Flying, swimming, digging, climbing, uh, photosynthesizing, gathering sunlight. Whatever it is, the species is, becomes populated by individuals who are good at doing it because they're descended from an unbroken line of ancestors that were good at doing the very same thing and from whom they have inherited the, uh, we would now say, genes uh, for doing the right thing, for, doing the, for, for surviving and reproducing. So to express it in more modern language, random genetic changes, which are called mutations, a majority of them are actually deleterious, but a minority are improvements, and those that are improvements tend to survive in the gene pool of the species. The gene pool <coughs> is the set of all the genes in the sexually reproducing population of the species, and it's called a pool because sexual reproduction seems to be uh, mixing them up, rather like stirring water in a pool. This modern way of putting it is called neo-Darwinism. Neo-Darwinism expresses evolution as changes in frequencies of genes, genes being digital entities, changes in frequencies of genes in gene pools. So in, in neo-Darwinism, natural selection is the non-random survival of randomly varying genes, which for present purposes we can regard as coded instructions for how to survive. We see, we admire the products of those genes, which we call phenotypes. The actual limbs, the actual eyes, the actual hairs, the actual horns, the phenotypes are the outward visible manifestations of the genes. You can think of them as tokens of the genes. The instructions for survival, the instructions for development are DNA, and their most visible products are bodies that survive by doing something impressive, as I said before, flying, swimming, running, digging, climbing, and so on all in the ultimate service of reproduction, which means passing on the genes, and that means they have to be good at attracting a mate, good at warding off rivals, good at doing parental care, whatever the species does in order to reproduce. Now, a more subtle point. An important part of the environment that each gene must exploit, if it's to ensure its survival in the form of copies of itself, is not just the external environment, but the other genes that it encounters in the genomes of a succession of bodies, which, because of sexual reproduction, means the other genes in the gene pool of the species. Because of this, cartels, you could call them cartels, of mutually supportive genes cooperate to build bodies that specialise in the particular method of surviving of the species grazing, hunting, whatever it is. Different cartels are the gene pools of different species bound together by the phenomenon of sexual reproduction, separated from other such cartels because it's part of the definition of a species that it cannot interbreed with other species. 
So there's a cartel of genes in carnivore, gene in, say, lion gene pools, a set of a cartel of genes in, in, say, wildebeest gene pools, and so on. And they do not meet, they don't exchange genes, they're separated from one another. New species arise usually because of an accident of geography, or something equivalent to an accident of geography, whereby a gene pool becomes separated into two sub-gene pools, sub-populations, which can no longer interbreed because they're geographically separated, or separated by something equivalent to geographical separation. The result of this is that they can diverge genetically, either randomly or by natural selection, diverge to the point that if they did meet it, when they do eventually meet each other again, they've diverged so far that they now can no longer interbreed. and They've become, by definition, separate species, descended from one ancestral species. That is the origin of species. And all species in the world have come into the world by that process of splitting of an ancestral species. Humans and snails are descended from a common ancestor, a common ancestral species. We don't know what it looked like, but we know it happened. And they split into two subpopulations, perhaps by some geographical accident, and they diverged and diverged and diverged millions of times until now we have creatures as different as humans and snails. At least in sexually reproducing species, as I've said, evolution consists of changes in gene frequencies in gene pools. And I have to specify sexual reproduction, because without it, without sexual reproduction, we have no clear idea what a gene pool even means. But where there is sexual reproduction, the gene pool is the set of available genes from which the individual members of a species could be seen as drawing their genomes, drawing as in a lottery, the lottery of sex. So each individual genome is like a shuffled pack of cards. The available cards to be shuffled are sampled from the gene pool. So every individual you see is a kind of one deal of the cards from the gene pool. The statistical frequencies of these available cards change as the generations go by, and that is evolution. We monitor evolution by measuring a sample of the phenotypes, the actual bodies, the actual colours and shapes of the animals, the anatomy, the physiology, and so on, behaviour. As the average phenotype changes, as legs get shorter or horns get longer or coats get shaggier, whatever it is, it's tempting to see natural selection as a kind of sculptor, a sculptor's chisel, carving the bones and flesh of the animals themselves. But if we want to talk chisels, a sharper representation of natural selection is to see chisels not as working on the bodies themselves of the animals, but on the statistical structure of the gene pool. As crests get longer, eyes get rounder, tails get gaudier, what's really being carved by the chisels of natural selection is the gene pool. As mutation and sexual recombination enrich the gene pool, the chisels of natural selection subtract, carve it into shape. And we observe the results in the form of changes in the average phenotype. We see horns getting longer, coats getting shaggy, or whatever it is. And it's the phenotypes that serve as the proxies for the genes whose frequencies are changing, the underlying changes that are going on. So as the external and visible manifestations of genes, phenotypes, actual bodies and organs, determine whether those genes are eliminated or whether they persist in the gene pool. And they determine it because if a phenotype's a bad phenotype and it dies before reproducing, all the genes inside it die with it. And so on average, good genes, genes that are good at building bodies, are, are statistically more likely than bad genes to end up in the gene pool of the next generation. And that is natural selection, and that's what drives evolution towards the illusion of design. You can therefore think of the species gene pool as a database which becomes a storehouse of information on how to survive in the environments of the past. It is therefore reasonable to see it as a database of information about 
environments of the past. It's a description in a digital code of the environments in which the ancestors survived and passed on the genes that helped them to do so. To the extent that present and future environments resemble those of the past, and mostly they do because the, the world doesn't change in a capricious way, this genetic book of the dead, as I called it, will turn out to be a useful manual for survival in the present and the future. The repository of this information about the past, about how to survive in the past, about the nature of the past, the repository of that information will at any one moment reside in the genes of individual bodies, but in the longer term, where reproduction is sexual and DNA is shuffled from body to body, the database of past environments will be the gene pool of the species. Each individual's genome, as I said before, in any generation, is a sample from the species database. Different species have different databases because of their different ancestral worlds. Like sand bluffs carved into fantastic shapes by the desert winds, the database in the gene pool of camels will encode information about deserts and how to survive in them. The DNA in mole gene pools will contain instructions and hints for survival in dark, moist soil. The DNA in predator gene pools will increasingly contain information about prey animals of the past, but useful for the future because prey animals don't change all that much. The DNA in prey gene pools will come to contain information about predators and how to dodge and outrun them. The DNA in all gene pools contains information about parasites, how to resist their pernicious invasions. Now I'll come back to Paley and the problem of how you get complicated things like eyes. There has to be a smoothly cumulative gradient of improvement from the early stages to the late ones, from proto prototype eyes that could hardly see at all right up to modern eyes that can see extremely well, like those of an eagle or a human. There has to be a continuous slope, a continuous gradual cumulative gradient of improvement. Otherwise, e it, the evolution of the complicated eye cannot happen. I want to recommend to the students in the audience uh, this book by G.C. Williams, Adaptation and Natural Selection. Williams wants us to be sparing in our recognition of adaptation. He calls adaptation an onerous concept, a burdensome con concept. It's a word that we should be reluctant to use, except in cases which are the product of long cumulative selection. And he gives an example of something which is probably not an adaptation, a fox wears a path through the snow with its paws. And it benefits from the path because it, it can run more quick, quickly because the snow has been worn down. But we would not wish to, to describe the paws as adapted for making paths in snow. It's an accidental byproduct, not an adaptation. On the other hand, the complex hunting behavior of the fox and all the organs that go into it evolved over many generations of cumulative improvement, and they are adaptations. So Williams's message there is don't assume that something's an adaptation just because it's good for the animal. Uh, it's, you've got to have a better reason than that. Here's another example, which is a slightly more borderline case. A fishing heron, you know, it stands in the water and pounces on fish, uh, uh, which are under the water, it, it seems likely that it would be more likely to see a fish if it looks at the fish in its own shadow, because it doesn't get the shimmering light on the surface of the water. But we probably wouldn't want to suggest that the heron's body is an adaptation to cast a shadow to improve fishing ability. The body can't help casting a shadow. On the other hand, if the heron took some sort of special steps to cast a shadow, then you might start to think, well, maybe this is an adaptation. So here we have a heron, um, and you see that it opens its wings when fishing. 
And so there's a suggestion there that the opening of the wings might actually be increasing the size of the shadow. But it's a little bit doubtful. You wouldn't be very convinced by that. On the other hand, we're now going to see a different species of heron, a black heron. Now that, behaving like a villain in a Victorian melodrama, um, that behaviour is almost certainly an adaptation to cast a shadow in order to better to see the, uh, see the fish. The apparent design of living things, of course, is what misled generations of people to think that because something looks designed, it must be designed. And as, of, as I've said, uh, it was Charles Darwin in the middle of the 19th century um, that we now know that there's another way, a genuinely effective way, in which apparently designed entities can come into being, evolution by natural selection. And now, of course, we understand that deliberate human design, design actually by human brains, what we might call true design, is itself a product of that older pseudo-design, which is natural selection. I want to call them paleo-design, the ancient pseudo-design, which is natural selection, and neo-design, the modern, true, deliberate, premeditated design, which did not come into existence until brains had evolved, and possibly brain-like things elsewhere in the universe. We don't know about that. And I think it's a delightful thought that natural selection, having hit on so many pieces of good pseudo-design, the eye, the wing, the ear, and so on, the heart, the sting, um, the brain should finally come up with a new device which actually mimics the process of natural selection itself and produces neo-design, neo the sort of design that makes bridges and planes and computers and cameras and tin openers and spanners and so on. Intelligence and design came late into the universe for a very principled reason, not just as a matter of fact. The reason is that intelligent entities like brains and computers, entities capable of designing things, are necessarily complex. They're statistically improbable in a functional direction, as I put it earlier. Complex, statistically improbable things don't just happen spontaneously by luck. That's what statistically improbable means. And this is the basis for the <coughs> commonest creationist objection to evolution, which is the generalization of Fred Hoyle's Boeing 747 argument. Fred Hoyle pointed out correctly that a hurricane blowing through a junkyard will never assemble a Boeing 747. To make a complex functioning entity like a kidney, a hand, or a brain, you've got to have a gradual step-by-step -step process of improvement. There's an element of statistical improbability in each of those small steps. But the mega improbability of something like a hand or a brain or an eye can only come about through a cascade of micro-improbable steps that occur one after the other. Cumulative selection. Paleo design by natural selection, can be bad design by the standards of neo-design, by the standards of a human engineer. Uh, imagine what the jet engine would be like if the designers of a jet engine had been forced to change a propeller engine step by step, nut by nut, rivet by rivet, and change it into a jet engine. It would be a pretty horrible jet engine. Uh, human designers have the advantage of being able to go back to the drawing board starting afresh. Natural selection can't do that, or only in a limited sense. Natural selection has to build upon what's already there, and all the intermediates have got to survive. Here are a couple of examples of revealing flaws in natural design. Uh, my favorite one is the recurrent laryngeal nerve, especially in a giraffe with its very, very long neck. Uh, the recurrent laryngeal is one of the cranial, is a branch of one of the cranial nerves, which means it starts in the brain and it, and it, goes, um, and, and it goes to its end organ, which is the larynx, the voice box. But it doesn't go straight to the larynx, it goes down into the chest and loops around one of the main arteries in the chest and then goes straight back up again to its correct end organ, the larynx. There is absolutely no point in that detour. And in the case of a giraffe, it's a very, very long detour indeed, 
as I personally witnessed when I assisted in a dissection of a giraffe for, uh, for television. Um, we, we, we actually watched, we actually saw this nerve speeding straight past the larynx and going all the way 10 feet or so down into the chest of the giraffe and then back up again to the larynx. The reason for this bad design is history. It's the jet engine effect again. Um, the fish ancestors of not just giraffes but all mammals had the equivalent of that artery and the equivalent of that nerve and in fish the equivalent of the nerve the most direct route to the equivalent of the larynx um, is indeed south of the artery um, and so it was the most direct route in the ancestors in the fishy ancestors of mammals and when mammals started evolving a neck fish don't have a neck when mammals started evolving a neck, uh, the, the detour became ever so slightly longer in every generation. And to borrow an economic concept, the marginal cost of, the sl of one millimeter more of detour was small compared to the marginal cost of the major embryological upheaval which it would have taken in order to jump the nerve over the artery. So history explains this bad design. Another example is in the vertebrate eye, the retina is backwards. Mol mollusks, and, and especially octopuses and squids, have very good eyes, which are very similar to vertebrate eyes. They're built on the same camera principle. They have a lens, and they have a, a dark chamber, and at the back of it is a retina, which has light-sensitive cells. Think of them as photocells. And in the octopus, those photocells are as they should be in a camera pointing towards the light. But in the vertebrate, they're pointing away from the light. They're pointing backwards. It doesn't too much matter, except that the, um, the nerves that connect these photocells, if we can call them that, to the, to the brain, therefore have to travel, they travel over the surface of the retina, presumably getting in the way of the light, though that's not a very serious effect. And then they have to dive through the retina to get to the optic nerve. And so there's a blind spot where they dive through the retina, which you don't get in the, in the octopus eye. Flagrantly bad design. The great German physiologist Helmholtz said he would send it back if he had been, in, if he had been presented with the vertebrate eye. Many other examples. Uh, the fact that so many of us, so many humans, um, suffer from bad backs is directly caused by the fact that we've only recently evolved bipedal locomotion from quadrupedal locomotion. Now, it's possible that something began to trouble you uh, when I was talking about this. I said that we wouldn't wish to describe the fox's path through the snow as an adaptation, and we might be doubtful whether the heron's body should be regarded as an adaptation for casting shadows. And in both cases, it's because the effect could easily come about by chance. And if it comes about by chance, there's no need to speak of adaptation. So the argument runs. And the point that may be worrying you is this. Isn't all adaptation supposed to start off as a chance effect? Mutation. Mutations are random. Random in the sense that they're not directed towards improvement. They're random. So how can I, on the one hand, say that the defining characteristic of an adaptation is that it's too improbable to come about by chance, and on the other hand, maintain that adaptations come about by Darwinian selection, which is the selection of those chance variations which happen to be beneficial. Surely every adaptation, no matter how complex, when it first started to evolve, must have been a chance effect, just like the fox or the heron. Well, the answer, when you think about it, turns out to be a matter of the number of generations of cumulative selection that have gone into the building up of the adaptation. An undisputed adaptation, like a bird's eye, has been built up by many generations of selection of chance improvements. In each one of those generations, the new mutation, which was being favoured, is properly described as a chance effect. But the series of mutations, the cascade of serial mutations in the same direction that have been accumulated over many generations to make the eye what it is today, 
uh, is not, cannot be described as due to chance. Quite the contrary. The effects of natural selection after a sufficiently large number of different genes have been selected over a sufficiently large number of generations, it's more non-random than you can possibly imagine. And that, of course, is the answer again to Fred Hoyles and his notorious Boeing 747. I put that in because that's actually a picture of me in an aircraft junkyard um, talking in, on television about this stupid idea. Now, one of the problems that people sometimes have with thinking about natural selection is that they think that so many of the characteristics that we, th that we call an adaptation seem to be too slight, too trivial to exert an effect. Aren't most differences pretty neutral with respect to survival? What about the hairs in our nostrils? Why do we have hairs in our nostrils? Um, it's been suggested that we have hairs in our nostrils to keep midges out or keep du dust out or something like that. Does, it really, does a bit of dust in your nose really affect survival? Does a, bit of, does a midge get it, does a mosquito get into your nose really affect survival to the point where natural selection would actually favour growing hair in your nostrils. Um, human intuition is misleading here. Uh, you have to remember that um, the effect of something apparently trivial, like the hair in the, in the nostrils, is going to be repeated thousands of times in thousands of individuals because every gene will, have, will be distributed, every copy will have copies of itself in different individuals in different generations. And only some of the individuals have to ha need to have their lives saved by having hair in their nostrils or something equally trivial. How might it save up the life of an individual? Well, if you are being stalked by a lion and uh, you get a bit of dust in your nose which causes you to sneeze, that could make the difference between spotting the lion in time to escape from it and not spotting it and being eaten by the lion. That's the kind of thing which you have to, th to think about when talking about trivial, apparently <coughs> trivial characters. Uh, Ledyard Stebbins, who's one of the founding fathers of neo-Darwinism, did a little calculation, a little hypothetical calculation, which is quite revealing. He tried to imagine a very, very, very weak selection pressure. That's to say, the advantage to the animals that have the characteristic, whatever it is, compared to those that don't have it, is very, very small. And he made it so small that it would have been undetectable to a field biologist doing research out in the field and trapping animals and measuring things. So small that it would be lost in what would be called statistical noise. So Stebbins set his selection pressure very, very small, very, very weak. But then he wanted to, he did a calculation to say, how long would it take to wreak some massive change in evolution. And the massive change that he imagined was a change in size from an animal the size of a mouse to an animal the size of an elephant. And when he set his selection pressure as weak as I've told you, he calculated how long it would take to, to increase the size of these animals from mouse size to elephant size. By the way, mice never evolved into elephants, don't be misled by this. But how long would it take for a mouse-sized animal to evolve into an elephant-sized animal? He calculated on reasonable assumptions about 12,000 generations. Well, 12,000 generations, um, perhaps the animal even might be one year per generation, it might be ten years per generation, whatever it is, it's a very, very small time when set against the scale of geological time. Uh, if it was 12,000 years, that would be too short to measure in the fossil record. It would look like an instantaneous change in the fossil record. And yet it's a, m a massive change from mouse size to elephant size. And the selection pressure that produced it is too weak to measure during the lifetime of a human researcher doing research on animals in the field. There's a mismatch between the, the time scale where um, the ecological time scale, the time scale of the human research worker, where evolution is moving too slowly to be detected, and the geological time scale, 
where that very same evolution is too fast to be seen as anything other than instantaneous. No wonder there are these notorious gaps in the fossil record. The wonder is we see any continuity in the fossil record at all. A second similar thought experiment by another of the great founding fathers of neo-Darwinism, making a similar point, by J.B.S. Haldane, a very irascible character. I see this, the caption, I just noticed it. It says, photograph taken by an undergraduate during a lecture at the risk of his life. Uh, Haldane, too, was concerned with trivial selection pressures, just like the, the hairs in your, in your nostrils. Um, and... Uh, again, he, um, he, he set his selection pressure very slight. He called it one in a thousand. That means for every thousand animals that survive because they've got hair in their nostrils, 999 animals survive if they haven't got hair in their nostrils. So it's a tiny advantage, the sort of advantage that no insurance actuary would even bother to notice. But under those conditions, it would take only just over 10,000 generations if you assume the gene is dominant, uh, 300,000 generations if you, if you assume it's recessive. Either way, it again would be too short, or might very well be too short, to be detected in the fossil record. So human judgment is wildly wrong when, when it judges something to be too trivial to be... Uh, significant for natural selection. Natural selection is a much more pernickety uh, observer than we humans are when we weigh up our own risks or when our insurance men, insurance actuaries weigh up risk. Now, the next topic I want to discuss is the evolutionary arms race an important aspect of the driving force of natural selection. Why are trees so tall? Um, but those are actually um, coast redwood trees which are phenomenally tall. The reason trees are so tall is because other trees are tall. Their natural habitat is a forest. They're surrounded by rival trees, rivals for sunlight. Like all plants, they're after sunlight. They are tall simply to overtop other trees which would otherwise overshadow them and steal their sunlight. If only trees could somehow sit down round a table and thrash out a kind of trade union agreement to be short, every one of them would benefit. But you can't have trade union agreements in nature. You have instead an arms race. Every tree grows taller and taller and taller in evolutionary time in order to overtop the others, and the limit only comes with when economics forces them not to grow any taller, when it becomes no longer cost-effective to grow any taller than that. That's an example of an evolutionary arms race. That's parallel, obviously, to a human arms race. There's a product of an evolutionary arms race. That's a predatory bird. Uh, an, an aero engineer would be proud to have designed such a beautiful aircraft as that not just the shape of the wings and tail, the behavior, the continual adjustments of the shape, the disposition of the flight surfaces controlled by the brain in a magnificently sensitive way, a highly sophisticated onboard computer controlling that aircraft. That's the product of an arms race. Uh, sometimes, however, design means improvement to survive, not in an arms race, but in changing climatic condition, something that is not an arms race. If it's cold, animals come to have thick coats of hair or feathers, and if it's dry, they evolve leathery or waxy waterproof skins to conserve what little water there is. Um, in, if, the, if, the, the, if the climate changes, if there are ice ages, if there are droughts, natural selection will simply track the fluctuations in the weather, and the hairiness <coughs> of the animal, whatever it might be, will track it, it'll just become more hairy when it gets cold, it'll become less hairy when it gets warm, and that's why you get things like woolly rhinoceroses and woolly mammoths um, in, in ice ages. The difference between the weather and a predator is that the weather is not out to get you. The weather is just the weather. It, it's not trying to kill you. It may kill you, but it's not getting better at killing you, whereas predators are. 
So there's an arms race between predators and prey. And as the predators get better and better at catching prey, so the prey have to get better and better at evading being caught. I've got a few examples here of end products of arms races. Uh, on the right, you see a, a rose thorn. On the left, what you see there are not rose thorns. Those are bugs. In the strict sense of the word, they're bugs, they're insects. Um, and they are clearly shaped to resemble rose thorns because natural selection has favoured those ones that resemble ro rose thorns. Um, here's another example. Uh, that is not a snake. That is a caterpillar. It's the rear end of a caterpillar and it looks like the front end of a snake uh, and natural selection has favoured those of its ancestors that resembled a snake um, slightly more than its, than, it, than its rivals. Stunning adaptations like these are nearly always the end product of an arms race. An arms race in this case between predators and prey, in other cases between parasites and hosts. A bat is a superbly engineered night-flying attack aircraft. It is the product of a long arms race between bats and their insect prey. The bat is equipped to fly fast in pitch darkness and to hunt fast-flying prey, uh, as I say, in, in total darkness if necessary. And the, and the chief adaptation by which it does it, as many of you know, is sonar, using echoes, echolocation, to bounce off targets and the brain is so sophisticated that it can, and we can use echoes to a very limited extent to work out roughly where a wall is if we're approaching it. But what a bat can do, and by the way, toothed whales and dolphins can do just about as well, uh, what a bat can do is to actually home in on a flying insect in pitch darkness by using echoes. Now, in order to do that, it has to have a very, very sophisticated um, computational system in its head to process the echoes give you a small picture of the sophistication of that instrumentation. Firstly, the cries that the bat emits have to be very, very high pitched because the, the, the lower the pitch, the more inaccurate the pinpointing of the target with the, with the echoes and physicists can work out why that is. So it has to be very, very high pitched and it is. It also has to be extremely loud in order to get the echo back that you, that you can use. But now we hit a snag, because if the sound of the cry that the bat is emitting is loud enough to be useful, it's also loud enough to deafen the bat, because it's so loud. Why not then make it quieter, because then the echoes wouldn't be effective? What is the solution to that? Well, some bats have adopted a very remarkable solution, which is to temporarily switch their ears off just before the cry goes out. They have a muscle which is attached to one of the bones in the ear, which, as you know, transmits sound from the eardrum to the uh, nervous apparatus, which is picking it up. So what the bat does is it pulls on that muscle and temporarily deafens itself by, by this deliberate pull on, on, on the muscle, then shrieks this incredibly loud sound, then releases the muscle just in time to pick up the much fainter echo as it comes back. So the cycle is pull, shriek, re re relax, take in echo. Well, that sounds all very well until you realise that when a bat is finally doing its its, its final run into the, to the insect, it may be crying at 50 times per second. And so that cycle of pull on the muscle, shriek, relax, take in echo, is being repeated at a rate of 50 times a second. Go, An incredible adaptation. Clearly the product of an arms race, or probably rather a long arms race, between bats and their insect prey. Yes, as I said, the weather is not out to get you. Uh, that is out to get you. Um, and that is out to be not got. Um, the lion and the impala 
are to each other not like the weather. The weather doesn't stand to gain from your death. The lion does if you're an impala. Uh, so unlike the weather, the lion is an active enemy of the impala. Now, it may seem odd to see the impala as an active enemy of the lion, but it is in the sense that if it succeeds in escaping from the lion, it increases the probability that the lion will die of starvation. So predators and prey are on opposite sides of an arms race, and parasites and hosts are on opposite sides of an arms race too. Now, again, I want to call your attention to something that might be worrying you. Uh, there are a couple of beautifully camouflaged insects. Um, on the left, that limb, that twig sticking up there is in fact not a twig, it's, a, it's an insect, it's a stick caterpillar. And it resembles a twig in the most remarkable detail. On the right, uh, there is a stick insect. Uh, you, may, you may have spotted it. Um, it's that thing there. You see a long, long stick body and the legs sticking out sideways. Um, two quite independent evolutions, independent evolutions of the stick form, which, by the way, is a fascinating fact about evolution that you get convergent evolution between different groups of animals. Now, here's the thing that might be worrying you. If it was the keen eyesight of birds say, that put the finishing touches to the perfection of the mimicry of stick by stick insect or stick caterpillar. If it was the eyes of the birds that, that perfected it, that, that put the finishing touches to the, to the, to the adaptation, how could, it have, how could those same birds or their ancestors have been fooled when the ancestors of the insects were just beginning to look like sticks. Because the ancestors didn't look like sticks way, way back. They, might, they would have looked like grasshoppers or just ordinary caterpillars. And somehow, the predators were fooled by a very, very slight ancestral resemblance to a stick. And yet, all the way up the gradient that I described to you, they had to be fooled by increasing resemblance to a stick until finally they put the finishing touches to the perfection of mimicry of sticks. Uh, well, one possible solution, which I think is the wrong one, is to say maybe back then the birds had pretty poor vision and the, their, their vision has been improving <coughs> at the same time as the, as the mimicry of the stick insects and stick caterpillars. I think that's probably the wrong, the, the wrong explanation. Here's what I think the right explanation is. When you look in good light, full frontal vision, at a stick insect or a stick caterpillar, you can just about make out the difference between a stick and a stick insect. I'm suggesting that the finishing touches of selection, the finishing touches of the evolution, were achieved when birds were exposed to the insects in a good light close up. But when, it, when the light is poor, or when the insect is just seen out of the corner of the eye, or is seen at 20 yards away instead of at, at 6 inches away, uh, then a very, very slight resemblance to a stick might have been enough to save the insects, to save the ancestral insect's life. So you can actually write down quite a lot of different seeing condition changes, like bright light versus twilight, full frontal vision versus peripheral vision, attentive vision versus casual glances. A bird may not be concentrating all the time, and close vision versus long distance vision. So I think that's probably the answer to the riddle of how the same predators, the same selectors, could have done both parts of the evolutionary process, both the early starting off when it was a very imperfect part of the arms race um, and then the um, putting the finishing touches to it as well. Well, I think that's probably a good place to stop for questions and in the next lecture, which will be attended, I think, only by the 
students um, of New College of the Humanities. Um, I will be going on to talk about a particular example of an, a beautiful example of an arms race, which is the, uh, the, the arms race between cuckoos and their hosts, and then going on to other things after that. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>